We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. My lab is um, primarily interested in, in um, understanding some of the molecular and cellular basis for the development of the cortex. But um, unlike some of the previous speakers, we're um, focusing on, on the development of neuronal connectivity and, and how circuits assemble basically in the developing brain. And so, you know, I'm going to move fast on the introduction because I think you've heard a lot. Uh, about um, the general interest of understanding what makes us human, and in particular, what makes our brain human specific. Another way to phrase that question, as you, as you heard before, is to ask what happened to our genome since we diverged from our common ancestor um, uh, more than 7, 10 million years. There's actually debate about that, that exact uh, time for divergence um, from our common ancestor. So, to the first question, what makes our brain uh, human specific? You have heard a lot today about the possibility that um, what makes our brain different from uh, our most uh, common living relatives like chimps and bonobos or to um, other uh, higher mammals would be brain size or at least the size of the cortex uh, relative to, to the rest of the brain. I would argue that despite the fact that that's the question that most people are interested in, it cannot be the entire uh, answer for a simple reason, which is that if you look at um, brain size expansion, including increase in, in neocortical size, many mammals have succeeded at this without any real gain in cognitive abilities. Right? In fact, um, um, brain size is best correlated to body size, not to cognitive abilities. Right? So, so brain size and neocortex expansion are, were probably an important step during evolution. And it, it happened many times during mammalian evolution, but it can't be the only explanation for what makes our brain human specific, at least in emergence of cognitive abilities. So, you know, many uh, open uh, remaining possibilities, neuronal composition, right? The, the type of neurons that, that are produced that Rick and, and others have talked about earlier. Circuit connectivity, the total number of synapses made um, uh, between neurons. Um, are things that will influence circuit function and, and probably cognitive abilities. Something that very few people have, have talked about, non-neuronal cells, astrocytes, microglia. Those could, uh, there's actually some very recent evidence suggesting that uh, differences in composition or total s number of non-neuronal cells might, might be different between human and, and non-human primates. So today I'm going to try to convince you that we have evidence, probably the first evidence, suggesting that um, a specific gene duplication event um, has um, pretty significantly changed both the number of synapses made between neurons and we think actually affects circuit connectivity and circuit function. So how did we get interested in this question? We got interested in this question based on the work of several groups, including uh, beautiful wor work from um, Evan Eichler that you'll hear uh, about just after me, so I'm not going to bore you with details about what Evan did. But back in early 2000s, uh, work from Jim Sikela and then refined and, and, and uh, expanded by Evan, identified um, gene duplication events that are specific to the human lineage. 
gene duplications, gene, new gene copies that are not present in any other non-human primate or in any other mammal. So, so essentially, what um, Evan has, um, has uh, shown uh, shown here on, on, the, on this on this graph. Um, so what Evan has shown is that um, in humans, you have a, a whole uh, list of genes, about 30 genes that have extra copies, essentially. So those copies um, are, are specific to humans. They're not found in, in non-human primates. Um, and um, unfortunately, or fortunately for us, most of those genes have a completely unknown function. That's not entirely true. There is one gene in that list, SMN1, which is the gene that's mutated in spinomuscular atrophy. It turns out that humans, and humans only, have an extra copy of this. And it's, it's actually a absolutely fascinating work that's been done on this. Um, there's a drug treatment that just emerged uh, very recently, actually taking advantage of the second copy, the human specific copy of his semen one. If you're interested, I can tell you more about. But for the vast majority, all the other genes have largely unknown function. And so, um, except that around the time when this, this uh, first work was published, there was one uh, gene in that list SRGAP2 listed here, um, that we were probably the only lab working on, on this gene at that time. And, and we had some uh, interesting uh, data suggesting that this gene was actually uh, import, playing important functions um, during brain development, at least the ancestral copy of this gene. But when uh, Jim Sikela and, and Evan Ackler published these results, we were struck by the fact that they're human specific copies of this gene. And so we um, we embarked on, on trying to characterize what those um, human-specific duplications of SRGAP2 do. So as a paradigm, basically, many questions arise from, uh, from this observation that, that, that there, there are human-specific gene duplicates for those. Uh, the first one is, which are, of those genes are expressed in, in, in the human brain? Uh, second question is, what is the function of the ancestral copy of these genes? As I mentioned, most of those genes have completely unknown function during brain development. So we had to start with this. And the third uh, question that's truly interesting is, is the function of the human-specific paralogs related to the function of the ancestral copy, or are those new copies basically um, acquiring some completely independent functions, some completely new functions, independent of the function of the ancestral copy? Right? Both scenarios could be true. So I'm going to summarize here, essentially, uh, about uh, 11 years of work from, from my lab, from multiple people in my lab. And then during the rest of the talk, I'm going to unpack and, and tell you a bit more about um, how we got to, to those conclusions. So essentially, SRGAP2A is an adapter protein containing three functional domains, this uh, F-bar domain, which is essentially a homodimerization motif, a central domain called the RAC-GAP domain. It's a, it's a domain that inactivates a small GPAs uh, called RAC1, and an SH3 domain that's essentially a protein-protein interaction motif. So, all mammals, uh, from rodents to non-human primates, and humans have uh, uh, this gene. It's expressed, it's highly expressed in the brain. It's expressed largely uh, in uh, only in neurons. And as I'll show you later on, it's, it's actually very unreached at synapses. But it turns out that about two to four million years ago, uh, two gene duplication events, at least, um, uh, uh, made um, uh, uh, this new copy that's human-specific emerge. Um, that we had to call SRGAP2C. And Evan will probably tell you a bit more about that. And so this um, coding sequence is truncated, actually. It doesn't express the full length protein. It, it's truncated. It expresses 90% um, of this f domain, which remains able to bind to the ancestral copy and largely inhibit its function. Okay? So its main function, so it turns out that we get essentially the same phenotype when we inactivate SRGAP2A or when we induce the expression of this gene, okay? And uh, the phenotypes we get are delayed excitatory and, and inhibitory synaptic maturation, this phenomenon called neoteny, um, which is essentially defined by retention of immature features for longer periods of time uh, during development. <coughs> we get increased density of both excitatory and inhibitory synapses. And finally, um, we, we get increased cortical, connect, cortical connectivity. This is largely unpublished. I, I won't, uh, have, probably won't have time to tell you much about this. So how did we reach these conclusions? So the first thing that we did um, a long time ago, um, in 2009, we published the uh, expression pattern for SRGAP2, and this very simple uh, observation that the, the protein in, in mouse uh, cortex is expressed actually peaks at P1, but is expressed largely at postnatal time when 
uh, between during the first two weeks of postnatal life when the animals are basically um, forming a lot of synapses. And so when uh, this very talented postdoc Cécile Charlier um, uh, joined the lab, she discovered that in fact, SRGAP2 protein is very enriched at synapses. This is high resolution images of individual synapses in mouse neurons. And I hope you can appreciate the fact that essentially there's very little SRGAP2 in small synapses and lots of SRGAP2 protein in, in uh, large synapses. Those synapses here are visualized. Those excitatory synapses are visualized by this protein HOMA1. Um, and it turns out that at that time we didn't know, but in fact those two proteins int function, int functionally interact. So, um, so what is SRGAP2 function in, uh, in, in synaptic development? <coughs> So neurons are absolutely amazing cells, if you think about it, right? Those cells are gigantic. Um, a fibroblast that people have talked about before would be the size of this cell body here, right? So they're gigantic cells. And um, in, a, a graduate student in the lab, Dan Yaskone, has um, developed some, some new methodology to actually, um, at single cell resolution in vivo, uh, visualize the presence and the topography of all synapses excitatory and inhibitory synapses made into a single neuron, okay? And so this allows us to, to understand both, to have very quantitative um, uh, ideas of where synapses are localized in neurons, how many they form, and, and you know, for a typical neuron like this, this, neuron, this layer two, three pyramidal neurons in a mouse forms somewhere between four and uh, 6,000 excitatory synapses, and somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 inhibitory synapses, right? So, Staggering numbers for just a single cell, right? And so if you zoom up on, on those um, green dots that you see here, those are individual spines, dendritic spines. I'm gonna talk a lot about those, um, those in the rest of the talk. Those protrusions, those uh, micron, this is a, the scale is a one micron here. Um, so those, they're tiny protrusions. They essentially constitute um, individual synapses. If you look at an EM picture of a single uh, spine like this, these protrusions, this is the site, basically a single spine constitutes a single synapse. It's the postsynaptic receiving end, basically, of a synapse. So this is an axon with those neurotransmitter field vesicles here that release neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft that then uh, activate uh, postsynaptic receptors here. So essentially, those synapses are the basis for neural communications, right? And, and um, decades of work by you know, hundreds of labs have identified um, uh, essentially a zoo of proteins, hundreds of proteins that are localized pre and postsynaptically here. And in dendritic spines, um, those proteins, the main job of those proteins, uh, including these homo shank uh, interacting proteins uh, I'm gonna tell you in a second, is to basically create a very complex scaffold to anchor and stabilize the neurotransmitter receptors here that sense neurotra uh, neurotransmitter release here. And so, um, we discovered that SRGAP2 look, uh, is, is actually directly interacting with Homer here. Um, and, and in fact, I'll show you uh, later on, SRGAP2 seems to control the, the, the scaffolding properties of, of those proteins and, and controls the rate of accumulation of those um, neurotransmitter receptors, such as AMPA receptors during development. So how did we discover this? Um, Takeuki Sasa, the, the first postdoc who was involved in this project, started by making a knockout for SRGAP2A for the ancestral copy in mice. So um, we, we, we made this knockout in order to ask what happens when we delete this gene. And the main thing that happens when you delete this gene is essentially that um, if you look at those spines, the size of the spines I forgot to mention is proportional to how mature it is, how many postsynaptic receptors um, have accumulated there. If you look at a, uh, an animal three weeks after birth, a wild type animal, those, those spines are already mature. So they have mature uh, synapses. Uh, there's you know, a lot of data uh, that, that has shown this. But then if you look at the um, uh, heterozygous, so if you delete one copy or two copies of the gene, you have um, a significantly sm a smaller spines at this juvenile time point. They have longer necks, so the neck that connects this spine head to, to, the, to the dendrites is longer. And, and most interestingly, there's a pretty significant increase in density of those spines. But interestingly enough, this, um, this uh, size effect is transient. So if you look at uh, P65, about 40 days uh, later, um, those spines reach maturation. So it's just a delay in maturation. Those, those spines, when you inactivate SRGAP2, seems to be much slower at, at reaching uh, maturation. Instead of being mature at P21, they're mature at P45. 
But in the adult, basically, those spines remain uh, having a longer neck and, and um, sig very significantly higher numbers, basically very higher, um, significantly higher density. So what happens if we humanize mouse neurons for SRGAP 2C? Right? I briefly mentioned before that our model based on, on uh, studies we published before was that the truncated version, the human specific version of this gene would bind to and inhibit the function of the ancestral copy. Right? So the prediction would be that if we express SRGAP2C in a mouse neuron that expresses uh, SRGAP2A, we would get phenotype that looked exactly like this. Right? And that's exactly what we found. Essentially, if you look at juvenile animals uh, control or SRGAP2C uh, humanized mouse neurons, you get this delayed maturation, right? But uh, they actually reach um, maturation at P65 instead of P P21, and they retain longer necks and, and higher spine density. So this was a very interesting result for us, right? This is because essentially we know that those three features, delayed maturation, uh, longer neck, which actually has very important function, and higher density are three phenotypes that are known to characterize human neurons compared to either mouse neurons or non-human primates. So beautiful work from Javier Di Felipe, uh, Rafa Yuste, my colleague at, um, at Columbia, have shown that if you look at spine density, for example, between human or non-human primates, or if you look at spine density between human and mouse neurons, you essentially get 30 to 50% uh, more um, dense, uh, higher density of spines, and those spines have longer necks. Um, and we also know that um, synaptic development in humans is, is profoundly neotenic, so basically very prolonged maturation, very delayed maturation. So this is interesting, right? Essentially, with um, just introducing a single gene that's human specific in mouse neurons, we phenocopy three major aspects of synaptic development, delayed maturation, higher density, and change in the morphology of those spines, right? But we have a problem, right? Which is that we know that um, changing and increasing the density of excitatory synapses cannot be um, the only explanation, since uh, beautiful work from Javier Di Felipe and many others have shown that there's an amazing degree of conservation in the ratio between excitatory and inhibitory synapses in, in, in the cortex, right? So we know that if, SRGAP2, if that's the only thing SRGAP2 was doing, increasing the number of excitatory synapses, we would have a problem, right? We would have a major imbalance between excitation and inhibition, which is the land, a landmark of many neurodevelopmental disorders, for example, uh, such as autism or, or epilepsy. So, so either SRGAP2 was doing the job and was coordinating the maturation of both excitatory and inhibitory synapses, or some other genes, maybe some of the other gene duplications that I mentioned before, would do the job. It turns out that, it's, that nature has selected SRGAP2 probably for a reason. It's because SRGAP2 does exactly the same thing it does at excitatory synapses at inhibitory synapses. So we discovered this because uh, more recently because now we can actually visualize um, inhibitory synapses with amazing uh, uh, accuracy using, uh, for example, this um, gepherin GFP. Gepherin is a protein that's exclusively localized at inhibitory synapses. And using single cell technology, single cell genetic labeling technology, um, we can not only visualize uh, with submicron precision uh, uh, spines, we can actually localize those inhibitory boutons, either the ones that are made on the dendrite shaft here, or even more rare boutons that are made directly on spine heads here. I can tell, tell you more about this later on. And remarkably, we find that um, the, the same thing happens um, then for spines, if you look at inhibitory bouton, if you downregulate SRGAP2A, the ancestral copy, or if you introduce and humanize um, mouse neurons for SRGAP2C expression, you get um, higher density of inhibitory clusters. Those, those um, inhibitory synapses are much smaller early on, but ultimately reach maturation at P65. And there's a change in their actual localization. There's a striking increase in, in the, ones, the, the inhibitory synapses made onto the spine heads here. So increased density and, and delayed maturation. Right? It's pretty remarkable. In fact, if you plot the normalized increase in density for spines and for inhibitory synapses between control and humanized mouse neurons, we get remarkably similar effects. Right? So the, the conclusion here is that nature has selected a gene duplication event that, um, of a gene that essentially controls the co-evolution of inhibitory and, and excitatory synapses. Right? This is really, um, I think, a very important take-home message. 
here. So I will, um, I will finish here by taking a, a minute to, to uh, recap everything I told you today. We've identified a, a gene, um, an, an SRGAP2A, which in its ancestral form, uh, expressed in all mammals, controls uh, three very important uh, 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 aspects of synaptic development. It controls the density of excitatory inhibitory synapses. Through work I, I, I didn't have time to show you, we were actually able to do structure function analysis in vivo using gene replacement strategies. And so we can actually dissociate how SRGAP2 regulates spine density and inhibitory uh, synapse density from how it controls the maturation of excitatory or inhibitory synapses. And we discovered that um, human, the human specific copy of this gene, which is this truncated form, uh, which remains able to bind to the ancestral copy and inhibits its function, uh, inhibits all three uh, major functions of SRGAP2. Right? So what are the future directions on, on, this, on, this, um, uh, on this project? So the, 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 there are three f future directions. The first one is what, what are the upstream regulators of, of, of this protein? I didn't tell you anything about how this gene is regulated and, and how the protein itself is regulated. We have some evidence of what's upstream of this. Um, uh, the second very important question is, what is where is this, this the increased number of connections coming from, right? So, so this gene basically, um, uh, the emergence of this human specific copy increases to the total number of synapses by 30 or 40 percent, which is very significant. Where, where are those connections coming from, right? Um, we have some, some ideas about this already. And, and finally, probably the most important is what aspect of circuit function has been affected by, uh, by the emergence of this human specific copy? That's, that's something that's much more difficult to approach. But believe it or not, we, we actually have some, some very uh, interesting uh, results about this. So finally, the people who did the work. The work was largely carried out by a very talented postdoc in my lab, Cécile Chaillet, who now has her own lab uh, in, at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, in France. Um, but um, she was assisted by many people, and uh, many people in my lab, uh, at least those four people listed here, are involved in, in, in current aspect of the project. And finally, uh, I'm excited, since I moved to Colombia about four years ago, Colombia is creating a third campus, actually, um, in, uh, called Manhattanville. And very recently, we went from an architectural sketch to an actual building um, that will host uh, 55 labs, about 1,000 people. So, um, the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute. We're very excited to move into this building, hopefully, this fall. Thank you for your attention.